it all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. My guest today is CEO Dale Easton. Dale is on a mission to scale clean eating without compromise. As the Chief Executive Officer of Snap Kitchen, he's responsible for taking the company's omnichannel business model to the next level. Before joining Snap, Dale spent time at Taylor Farms, where he serves as the Chief Operating Officer, and he also spent over eight years at LSG Sky Chefs. Dale graduated from Manchester University in the UK and the Royal Institute of Public Health and Hygiene. Dale Easton, welcome into the corner office. Thank you, Brent. That sounded so impressive, I'd even give the guy a job. <laughs> well, it is an impressive background. And of course, our goal today is, you know, to understand how you've gotten there. Um, many of our audience in the middle market, as I was chatting with you before we started, you know, have got their eyes uh, on that corner office, or at least to get into the C-suite. And we always like to kind of start with the early years. You know, tell us a little bit about growing up and, you know, what your family life was like. I, I as- Assuming that was in Scotland, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, firstly, thank you for letting me join you today. I'm, I'm truly excited to spend some time with you. <laughs> yeah, I was actually, I was born on the west coast of Scotland uh, in the town of Paisley. Uh, most people know Paisley because of the Paisley pattern. So when you see ah. the silk robes that were really popular in the 80s and the, the silk shirts that you still see today, Paisley as a pattern is, is quite a popular design. And that was Actually, it was a Persian design originally, but it was actually manufactured in the town of Paisley. Interesting. Just outside Glasgow. And, uh, and I, was, I was born there. Uh, a wonderful town. Uh, and uh, so seven of a family, my mum and dad and five children. I'm the second, old, second oldest. And uh, I have an older sister, two, two younger brothers and a younger sister. And uh, they're all doing extremely well. And most of them are still in Scotland. Uh, albeit I've traveled most of my life, but I had a, a wonderful upbringing, great family life, uh, strong family values. Uh, my mom and dad, in actual fact, were married at the age, my mother was 18 and my father was 19. Wow, very young. Yeah. And, and uh, my mom at 26 had five children. <laughs> oh, wow. so, so Pretty much I, one a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now I have four. I really understand just how tough and difficult that must have been for my mom. but uh, <laughs> It's exponential, not ge- geometrical, right? Absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, no, great upbringing, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, and, you know, I, I love my family dearly. They're, so they're, so they're mom must have been pretty much a stay-at-home mom. What did your dad do? Yeah, so my father, my father when I was uh, really young growing up, up until about eight, nine, or ten, my, my father worked, uh, it was actually Chrysler originally, uh, became Talbot, and it was a car plant in a town just outside of Paisley called Linwood. Okay. And literally, uh, the American company opened up. My, my father worked in the car plant. Uh, I always remember that the best Christmas parties we ever seen because this American company really believed in the culture of investing in people. And, and my father, he'd probably tell you today it was one of the best jobs he ever had. Uh, unfortunately, in the late 70s, early 80s, it was at the peak of the, the, the unions. Uh, and, you know, the Americans decided that if the union didn't ease off and allow them to improve productivity, they would pull out and leave. And they eventually closed the plant. 
Uh, and when they actually closed the plant, the town became a ghost town. And it's only in the past two or three years that it's starting to get revitalized as a town. So it took a long time to go over Chrysler and Talbot leaving. And I'm sure that was a tough period for him to go through. Was he an engineer? Was he more in operations? What was his training and background? My father was in operations, and he 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 was basically one of the key paint in the paint shop that would be painting the cars. Uh, and um, but you know, my father was really, really a, a huge influence on my life. And how so? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, you know, if you imagine, if you imagine a guy bringing up his his children, and then in his early 30s, decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to change my whole career path. And uh, I always remember that we had to be quiet because dad was studying in the bedroom uh, because, we, you know, we were in a small house and, you know, three bedrooms, but we, three bedrooms, one bathroom, and we all shared and se- seven of us in there. So dad would literally study in the bedroom and he decided in, uh, still young by today's terms, but, you know, in later years to studied to become a podiatrist oh wow and, and my Big father shift. went from being in you know an automotive plant to yeah. uh in the uk they would typically call it chiropody and a chiropodist but it's podiatry right and he graduated top of his class and my father then opened up his own surgery wow. uh, and he's retired now of course but he he literally became a podiatrist now, would that have been considered a medical degree? Was it yes, more of a vacation? Yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's a medical medical degree, and he he just decided that, that if he's going to improve the quality of life for his family, then he was going to do something different, and uh, a, a huge swing, of course. Uh, and he he did it, and I, I just always amazed by it that you know having bringing up young children and still focusing on his studies and. Uh, you know, and still having to work while studying, he did everything, and and he did it. And so was it a sense of admiration for hard work, um, the ability to turn around and go in another direction? What what did you admire most about that? Yeah, you know, as as you get older and you realize just what's involved in the the brave decision to change career path. So that that obviously in later years, you know, gives me a lot more admiration. But I think at the same time, it was. Just not only did he have time when he would go and study, but he'd also had time to come and take time to play with the children and had time for us. Uh, you know, so he had that balance. He had that balance. And of course, you know, mom had to keep the whole house together and try and <laughs> no ma- small feet with five yeah, kids. Yeah, and manage these crazy kids. So mom was always the, you know, she had to do the discipline side. Uh, and in those days, you got the slipper when you misbehaved. But we bought we bought the <laughs> slippers at Christmas, so they were always fluffy. So so we, we never quite go. we never quite felt it. But uh, but she managed she managed the discipline of the house, which she did a great job. And uh, and Dad went back and you know he literally went back and studied and changed his career. So really really impressive, and it just it shows you what you can do when you put your mind to something. Who or what else were some of the early influencers in your life, Dale? Yeah, you know, so I, when I look back on it, uh, I was close to my grandparents, both sets of grandparents, and uh, I lost my last grandmother just, you know, in the past four or five years uh, that, that she's passed away, and she lived to a ripe old age. Uh, but uh, in my father's side, my gran and papa, my papa died, we call him, in, in Scotland, grandfather is papa, we call him papa, uh, and papa died... Uh, when I was eight, but my gran lived for many years on her own, but just a strong lady who was a great influence. I, you know, I loved and adored her. Uh, I used to love when I was a kid, I'd walk over on a Sunday to go and cut her grass, take care of a garden for her and, you know, just spend time with my grandmother. And, uh, and both sets of grandparents were amazing. My grandfather on my mum's side, he was a cooper who made barrels for Chivas Regal Whiskey Distillery. And, uh, you know, so just just amazing people, but just hard working class individuals that brought working class values into the family. Uh, so they were a big influence on me. And uh, I guess my early hero would always be Muhammad Ali. I'm a boxing fan. I, Is that right? Yeah, okay. I, I, <laughs> I started boxing at the age of 12, amateur boxing and my brothers. So we all boxed all through our, our teen years and. I think in my last boxing, I, I actually stepped out of the ring when I was about 22. I went back in later years. but So I, I always remember in Scotland when I was a kid, and 
I'm not that old, but it was long before all we had Sky Television. So we had BBC One, BBC Two, and STV, which was Scottish Television. And so we would be allowed to sit up in the early hours of the morning because the fights from Muhammad Ali were in the US. Of and my, course, and my yeah. dad is a huge boxing fan. So we'd listen to live fights on the radio. Uh, and I just was always amazed by him. And and then in just a few later years, uh, up until today, one of my huge heroes is Sir Alex Ferguson of Manchester United, who right now is actually uh, in hospital uh, fighting to get over some uh, brain surgery. But I'm, I'm quietly confident he's going to be OK. But a huge mentor, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit later, and and a huge, as we call football, you would call soccer. Yeah, soccer, right. Uh, huge football fan. And when I was a child in Scotland, it was Glasgow Celtic. And then in later years became Manchester United, and it still is my passion today. Yeah, well, obviously a very successful team and one with quite a following. Um, we haven't touched on school, so were you a good student, Dale? Tell us a little bit about those years, uh, elementary through what we would call high school. Yeah, no, absolutely not. Uh, I would love to sit here and lie to you, but uh, <laughs> now, now my oldest sister, Annette, she was, as we would say, a prefect, so she patrolled the school and she was a teacher's pet and She'd come home and tell mum and dad that I was in the headmaster's office. And, you know, so she was the blue angel and, and I was the kind of the naughty kid. But I then in high school, I went to, I grew up a Catholic background and I, I went to an all boys Catholic school, 400 Catholic boys. And, uh, you know, we had to wear our black blazer, shirt and tie, polished shoes, gray trousers, very strict. Uh, but I, you know, I think I was a class comedian, actually. I had a, I had a lot of fun, but if any of my... You honed those presentation skills early on, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, but if any of my teachers are listening, I truly apologize. It must have been hard. Uh, but, but it was interesting, actually, because it's only when I went first started at college that I realized the difference from ad, adult education to, you know, teenage education, you know, trying to manage 400 boys, I, I fully understand. And if you can imagine... And our, our headmaster wore the black cloak. In those days, you actually got the belt, the leather strap across your hands <clears throat> for misbehaving. And uh, so it was a very strict run school. And then, of course, you go on to college and then it's the call you Dale, whereas at school it was Easton. And I used to hate that. Uh, there was just no, there no warmth to it. And then you realize when you get into adult education, it's just a totally different field, which I, I went on to really, really enjoy and still enjoy today. Now, growing up in Europe is a little different than the U.S. You know, it's very typical for a CEO, as we've had many on the podcast, say they had a paper route or if they were a woman CEO, folded the papers for their brothers or perhaps sold greeting cards at Christmas. Were there any kind of entrepreneurial things that you engaged with or was school and your and your boxing and perhaps soccer kind of more, uh, you know, how you spent your free time? No, I actually, yeah, I actually had a, a number of jobs uh, uh, growing up and uh, some at the same time, actually. But I, I've always had some, yeah, so I, I actually had a paper round uh, and it was actually uh, such a large paper round that when I finished with it, I actually divided it into two and gave it one side to my brother and one to my sister. The younger ones, it was large enough to give them some cash. Uh, at the same time as doing newspapers, I also, in, in Scotland, we used to have paraffin heaters, which to keep the houses warm, because, uh, you know, uh, most of our working class homes didn't have central heating at that time. And we had paraffin heaters that kept the house warm, and I would go around and sell paraffin. Uh, and I was just a kid that sat in the back of the van and ran up the stairs and delivered. Uh, and then in the winter months, uh, my entrepreneurial skills were great, because when the snow would come, <laughs> uh, I would get all the kids in the street with me and we'd knock on the doors and shovel all the snow off the paths and then go home that night and pray that it would snow again so that I could <laughs> I could repeat the, repeat the whole process again the next day. So, And then, of course, in Scotland in the winter, the winters are pretty harsh. And then in summer, it's still light at 11 o'clock at night. <clears throat> so, you know, you can really get out and play as a kid and, and then... So from an entrepreneurial side, that was uh, the jobs that I had. And it was just a, a way of earning that extra cash that you needed as you were growing up as a teenager. And let's talk about that cash. What, what did you spend that money on? Were you a saver or did it go to the equivalent of, you know, what baseball cards would have been for kids growing up here, uh, yeah. admiring pieces yeah. of your soccer fans? Or yeah. how did you uh, or what did you do with those funds? 
Yeah, no, I'm a I'm a big saver today, but I wasn't that smart then. But I <laughs> I always have always had a love of music, and uh, so I uh, still today I love live music. Uh, I love all types of music. But when I was growing up, teenager, uh, I was at that stage. I was kind of into punk rock, and then went from there into kind of new wave came out, which was, you know, David Bowie and all orchestral maneuvers in the dark, all those guys. So I used to head up to Glasgow on the train and go to, there was a store called Listens and just sit there all day listening to music and buy records. Yeah. Uh, you know, LPs back, back then, I presume. Back then it was LPs and sing, singles and, um, and bring them all home and just, just listen to music. And my friends were all into the same thing. <clears throat> so it would just be always, you know, spend my money in, in, in the, in the record shops uh, and, and the usual junk that you would spend it on. So not a big saver in those days. Did you did you play a musical instrument as well? Did you aspire to that at all? So uh, interestingly, I, I actually have uh, a couple of guitars at home. I cannot read music, but I can sit and strum and listen to it and pick it up. Uh, I have a, my, my, my son today is actually a music teacher. Uh, so my 25-year-old son, he's graduated and he's just finished his first year as a uh, middle school uh, vocal and choir director so he is extremely talented and so I, I see that talent in him uh, and he's, he's way more talented than I've ever been but uh, and he's also a, a great vocalist so but music's always been a big part of my life I find it extremely relaxing uh, and I, I love to listen to music and escape absolutely so you decided to go to college, and it sounds like Dad, other than his uh, uh, studies afterwards, did not go to university. Is that correct? That's correct. So you were the first, or did, did yeah, uh, Big I Sister was, Annette also uh, no, no, head I, off the university? Yeah, no, I, I was the first, uh, and I actually uh, I picked Manchester because I had uh, my mom's sister, my aunt. She actually moved to Manchester, so I had family in Manchester, and I also had a love of Manchester, just the city, the Manchester United, the city, uh, Manchester Business School, Manchester University, great schools. And uh, at that time, I had actually gone down to work uh, in in-flight uh, for then it was THF, Trust House 40, uh, which today is now Alpha, uh, Alpha LSG. And they had an intern program that when I, I joined them, I actually got onto their intern program. So I started in college first in Greenock in the west coast of Scotland, where I went to culinary school to do what's known as 7061 basic cookery based on uh, Scoffier's French cuisine. And my brother, who is 14 months younger than me, uh, he went first and he went into culinary school and I decided to follow. Uh, quickly realized that it's really hard work in the restaurant in the <laughs> restaurant business and you have to be there till the last customer leaves and uh, but I've stayed in the food business all of my career so that that start was a good start for me and was, then, was going to college a big decision uh, something that your parents had encouraged you to do was that kind of looked upon yeah, as this yeah. is what Dale will do or yeah well you know they they always give you know a lot of support and guidance and and, you know, one of the things that I always remember a friend telling me in the, those early stages was that, you know, if you become a chef, you will never be unemployed. <laughs> people <laughs> uh, always have to eat. <laughs> people have to eat. So that was kind of a big motivator. Uh, and and to be tr truthful, I've never been unemployed. So, <laughs> so, so those proof early, that one out. Yeah, proof that one out. Uh, but then I went back in, uh, back to do, the, you know, uh, my business degree. Uh, and did NEBS, which is National Education Board for Senior Management. And then, in the uh, so that was at Manchester, Manchester University. But then at the same time, in the food business, food safety compliance was changing pretty dramatically. Uh, they were bringing in what's known as HACCP, which is Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. And it really changed the food safety code. So I decided I would go and study just an intermediate class at the Royal Institute and went along and really enjoyed the topic uh, and decided I would go further. And I then went and did the diploma. Then I went further and did advance into HACCP and food safety. So I got that side as well, which was really useful as well in, in later years uh, under food safety design. I started designing in flight facilities that I could design to code uh, as I went forward with it. And then at the same time, our company, under THF, Trust House 40 was basically had the, the largest revenue stream was the hotel stream. 
and they had the hotel. So, for example, at the George Sang, the five-star hotel off the Champs-Élysées in, in Paris was the 40 Hotel. And THF then became 40. And they sold off the in-flight division, which I was with, and they sold off a division they called Gardner Merchant, which did industrial cafeterias and restaurants. And when the in-flight side sold off, we basically became Alpha PLC, and we didn't have the funding behind us that we had from the, the large you know, family company. So we then had to start to be extremely lean, and the company at that time brought in Alexander Proudfoot Consultants to help us to start a lean journey of lean manufacturing. And I just had such an interest in it. They recognized quickly that I had skills in managing change. People respected me. And I got onto a journey that, you know, I've loved, dearly loved all of my career, which was operational excellence in lean manufacturing. And, and I know we'll talk later about Porsche, the sports cars and all the stuff there. Well, let, let's back up a little bit. What was that first job out of college? Was it with THF? It was. It was. It was with THF. And so you did an internship with them, it sounds like. Yes. And, and, their program, and then they offered you something full time. Yeah, the program was a three a three year program. And it's just such a shame that organizations can't do it today because in the in-flight side, their program, there was actually six originals and we're all still pretty good friends all these years later. And you had to learn, you had to spend three months in every department. So finance, you were doing finance, but when you went into the airline wash, so when you imagine being on your aircraft and they bring the carrier down the middle with the meals or the drinks, all of that has to be washed and rotated. And when you worked in the wash department, you literally rolled your sleeves up and you worked in the wash. (laughs) And their view was, if you're going to learn how to do this and manage people, You need to understand every functional area. So true. And it was an amazing program. So at the same time you were going to school, plus you were learning, you know, live the aspects of of business. And and they had high expectations of that team. And all of us went on to be, you know, extremely successful because of that program. I always take it back there where... I went from there that I got my first little unit where I was a, at the age of 24, I was running a cook freeze plant for the company. And, you know, so my career went on from there and it was basically based on that intern program. What were some of those early leadership lessons you learned from, from bosses and mentors you had during those early years? Yeah, well, you know, when, when I actually started uh, in, into that role, we were still in the in-flight days, uh, the earlier days, we were still pretty strong, a pretty strong unionized environment. And then in those days, it was the Transport and General Workers Union. So all communication had to be extremely clear. And if I sat an employee down to promote them or to reprimand them or any communication whatsoever, you had to give them the right to have a shop steward with you. So you can imagine, you know, you really had to be grounded in how you followed the procedures. Sure. Yeah. What you said and how you said how it. How you said it. And, and to be truthful with you, uh, it's one of the areas where I, I much prefer guidelines to procedures. I think guidelines, guidelines allow for common sense and, and procedures. Sometimes you have to make decisions that are not always the right ones, <laughs> but it, it allowed me to, to really learn to hone in good communication skills and I think the second one is in the in-flight industry, the employees that are manufacturing the meals who are just the salt of the earth, they're wonderful people, but they're working in a chilled environment and they're probably getting, you know, one dollar above the minimum wage. And you have to be able to motivate them. You have to be able to just appreciate them and take good care of them. Uh, because they could go to McDonald's for another dollar an hour. And so it, it taught you those principles of respecting the team from below. Uh, and, I, and it's something that I've pride myself today that I've never lost, where I, I want to know the name of my employees. I want to be in the departments. And, and I, I learned that very early on in my career. Dale, tell us about the first time you started managing people. What was that like? Was it uh, probably older people than you, I can imagine, uh, some of the union environment or outside of it? Yeah, you know, in the airline industry, which I went on, as you, you know, I spent a long time in the airline industry, which I dearly loved. But I, in the... The early meetings I would go to, there were leaders there who had been in the industry for 25 and 30 years. And I used to sit there and think, 
how could anybody do this for 30 years? <laughs> and then I found that after 27 years, I was that guy. So <laughs> You were that guy. So right. I could understand it gets into your bloodstream. And, uh, but they were, they were definitely older guys. Uh, but I remember, and it's not to sit here and blow my trumpet, but I do remember that I had a boss at one time who said in a meeting in front of all of his team, and I was part of the team, he said, Dale, if we were in the First World War in the trenches, and I said as a leader, we're going over, I wouldn't have to look if you were there. Mm, he, says, wow. others would, he said, others would say, and this was in front of the team, he said, others would say, but they're firing missiles, or there's grenades, or there's bullets. He said, you would go. And, and, and it was true, because so, what I actually did is every opportunity the company had, whether it would be open another airport, I, I, I helped open Charles, Charles de Gaulle, I would raise my hand, uh, pack my suitcase, and I would go. You know, that's very interesting, Dale. We've heard this a couple of times from CEOs. You know, there's so many jobs that people don't want to do, but you advance by saying, I'll give it a try. You know, let, let me step in. Let me go help. Let me go do that. And that's so well respected by those uh, in more senior positions. Yeah, and I always took the opportunity. So then I became one of the youngest general managers. Then I became one of the youngest directors. I took on a project called Innovate to put lean into all 27 alpha facilities. And, you know, I just, I always signed up for opportunities all through my career. And, and I've got to travel the world and I've been, you know, blessed with that. And, and, but it was just a very early learning that said, if you're really going to go on here, you just have to pack the suitcase and go where the company needs you. Let's expand on that a little bit. Um, share with us some of the best or, or perhaps worst lessons you've learned from previous bosses that uh, still stick with you today. Yeah, you know, to as they say, to protect the innocent. I, 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 <laughs> you don't have to mention that. No, absolutely. Ab <laughs> absolutely. But I remember growing up in the earlier stages of my in-flight management career. And one of the, 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 the boss that I had at the time, the particular boss at the time, was completely paranoid that he was going to be dismissed. And, and he, he actually fulfilled his own prophecy by it because he, he just used to get myself, there were two, three of us who ran three separate units and we were all young. We were really learning, but he would share such emotions about, you know, there was just had a meeting and I've not been invited. I know I'm on the agenda. And he would share this, this fear that we used to dread having the meetings and he just didn't realize that sometimes as a senior leader, you have to protect and keep that away from the team below you. And he just was so transparent. And eventually they changed him. Uh, and I, ironically, I went on to <laughs> take on a bigger role and eventually I had a higher role than he had at that time. But it, it taught me that showing those panic emotions when all around you are panicked is just the wrong thing. It serves no value whatsoever. So I, I I learned from him ironically that under under pressure, when others expect you to do something, do the opposite, and and just remain calm. Uh, and that was that was a tough two or three years. Uh, but you know, eventually he was replaced by someone who's still a dear friend and mentor to me today, which was the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, a, a chap called Don McRitchie, who has now retired. Uh, but just such a dear friend, and he was just a fantastic, fantastic leader that just showed you how it should be done. How would you say your leadership style evolved over time? You know, on your journey to the corner office, Dale. Yeah, I think in the in the earlier stages, growing up in a manufacturing background, I always had the subject matter expertise. So I, I knew that I knew the business, uh, I, I knew that side of it. Uh, I believe I've always had good people skills because I just enjoy working with people. Uh, that that side was always was always strong. I think the key with uh, one of the bigger learnings as as time has gone on, and especially in the world I'm in today, which you know private equity and startup, is is the value of the pound or the value of the dollar, which which basically making sure that you fully understand the ROI in all investments. Uh, and in the earlier stages, I would sometimes get the task done before I'd really look at you know, the true ROI of that task. Uh, so really learning the analytics and learning the financial way around the P&L uh, and really understanding the cash flow side of the business is something I learned in late, later years, certainly the last, you know, 15, 20 years in, in good detail. 
But in the earlier stages, it was more the task that I enjoyed, the project, getting the project and get it done. And I, and I was very successful, but today uh, I, I tend to really focus on surrounding myself with great subject matter experts and, and really honing in on those, those ROI mindsets and, and the, those type of projects. Let's shift a little bit and talk about company culture. Now, you uh, obviously were THF, which became LSG Sky Chefs, as I understand the, the evolution with that. Large company, you know, corporate um, culture, pretty well established, obviously still around today in different iterations. And now you're, you know, working with a middle market, private equity backed company. What are your thoughts on building a company culture and how do you go about doing that? Yeah, it, it's it's interesting. I always knew that. I had strong values in the cultural side of the business. When I ran Manchester Airport, eventually when I became the GM, I was actually the first leader to be awarded investors and people, which is, I guess, the equivalent of J.D. Powers in the U.S. And I was the first company in Manchester Airport, and I was the first company within the THF group. And then it became Alpha. The company progressed to become 40. Then it became Alpha in-flight services. Uh, and I was the first. And I was driving it with my team, but really understanding not only that culture was imp- important, but how do you develop future leadership? And, and how, do you, how do you take that so that employees feel that they're connected to the values and the strategy of your company? And it was something I learned very early on at, at Manchester Airport that I've stayed and it's remained with me constantly and it's still with me today. Uh, and in the tr- interestingly, as I recruit uh, senior leaders today, when I was growing up in the business world in the earlier stages, most individuals were with a company for 10 or 15 years uh, and it was seen as a long-term commitment. And I find when I look at resumes today that I'm seeing individuals in their late 20s, early 30s, with a resume that has two and three two years, three years. Yeah. As, as a long time within the company. And at first, I actually read that as a lack of commitment. Uh, and what I've truly learned is, in actual fact, it's not. If you're getting three or four years out of a leader, then you have to be at the top of your game. You have to be keeping them fulfilled. They have to have a mission and, and believe in your values of your company. and. So the, so the competencies don't change from the earlier stages of the learnings to today. Uh, what changes is you just have to be at the top of your game and continually make them feel part of the vision and strategy of the company. And then if you keep them for three or four years, you've actually done extremely well. Yeah, the ROI on that's huge. It's huge. It's huge. Uh, so I think the days of 10 to 15 years in organizations have gone. and uh, But the... The cultural side of taking care of people, making them feel involved in the strategy and the vision, uh, and being connected with them. And I've always had an open door policy, all, always, uh, and I still have today. No matter what I'm working on, if someone knocks on the door, I'll stop what I'm doing and I'll, I'll sit down and and I'll have a chat and and just mentor them in any opportunity I get. What's unusual or or perhaps unique about your culture at Snap Kitchen? Yeah, well, so Snap was my, again, my first experience in startup. So I've always been a, a large corporate guy and I came in. Big transition. Yeah. So I, of course, I turned up for my interview in my suit and my shirt and tie. And, <laughs> you know, I'm still. I'm I could have coached you on that. Yeah, but I'm, st- I'm <laughs> still very British in some ways. You know, I, I, I try to. Hopefully, one day all these shirts that I have are going to come back in style. I know they are. <laughs> so I, I, I and the ties as well, and the, the ties as well. Uh, that, so I, and I could see them all look at me as if I was some sort of fool. And uh, but I, I was um, lucky enough. I was approached by the El Catterton Investment Group, who are one of Snap's investors, and and Dave Kirchhoff at the time was the CEO, who just a, a great friend of mine and. And Dave came from Weight Watchers, and he's now at iFly, and I replaced him as the CEO. Uh, and Dave interviewed me. Was he one of the founders? Uh, he wasn't the original founder. No, that was that was Brad Radolf uh, and Martin Burson, two two great guys. Uh, they came up with this wonderful creative idea. But but Dave came in to really put in some structure and start to shape the company, and he recruited me. Uh, so I was his COO, uh, and Dave is you know six foot one, six foot two, absolute incredible physique. You know, this guy was in a snap T-shirt and jeans, 
Uh, and I thought, okay, I'm going to have to get to the gym. So, <laughs> but I, I and lose the suit and lose the suit. Uh, so I'm sat here today with my my jeans on and my my shoes and my shirt untucked and all that trendy stuff. And uh, <laughs> so I, I learned though that you know the cultural side is incredible because it's a the, the, we have 650 employees. We have front of house, which are the retail stores. We have middle of house, which is distribution logistics, and then back of house, food manufacturing. And then there's 60 team members here in Austin at headquarters. And probably the average age of the office is about 25, maybe 26. So it's a young team and some great, great brains in this young team, which is amazing dynamics. But in this office, you can bring the dog to work. Uh, we have a basketball hoop next door in the warehouse. We have table tennis. I do a, a town hall meeting every two weeks where I'm fully transparent on the business and how we're performing. I record- Are you an open book business in the sense yes, that you share financials? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I always have been. Uh, and a lot of people are nervous about that. But I learned early on that, you know, you don't lose business on what your competitor's doing. You lose business on what you're doing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sharing things that someone else could get their hands on. But at the same time, in startup, the team have to understand how we're performing. Uh, and I, I like to keep them updated. And every month since I've been over and taken over the helm, we've just got significantly better over the past six months. And it's just a, an amazing story. Uh, and still to be told, we've got a lot to do. But I, I like to be clear and transparent. And then once a month, I actually, I have a, a, a young superstar in my team who literally is into filmmaking. And he has about $300,000 worth of the most amazing equipment so he actually records a message every month, and I and I, I invite a team member from the business to sit beside me, and then I will give a business overview. The employees can give and ask questions, and I answer the questions, and then I'll introduce my my team member who's with me, and they'll do a little bit about what they do in the company, and that goes out every month. That goes out to all your all, stores. all yeah. of the six hundred employees, uh, and then they know what's going on in the business. So. I like I like that side of it. We have a lot of bean bags and you know all the comfy <laughs> stuff you do in startup and twenty uh, first century company. Yes, yeah, a twenty first century it. company. We don't measure the clock. Come and go as you please. Uh, our team, you know, we just have a lot of fun. Uh, it's always day like you know, Mister Easton's my father. I don't I don't have that formal. I you know no, <laughs> nobody needs to tell me I'm the boss. I, I realize that, and I just I like to treat the team with dignity and respect. We've got a few minutes left, but I want to talk a little bit about hiring. Dale. What, what do you look for when you're making bets on the people you invest in? Yeah, I'm, I'm always looking for, I'm looking for leaders that have taken risks in their career. I like to see individuals that have taken some real brave decisions uh, and, you know, and, and taken on, taken on challenges. Uh, it, it, it's such a, such a fundamental uh, as you well know, in today's leadership world, where you, you've got to have that bravery to take on challenges. And so that's that's kind of number one. I try to see that through the resume. Uh, subject matter expertise is obviously critical. I like to recruit individuals that know what they're doing and then give them a vision and allow them to do their job without micromanaging. Uh, so those, those type of skill sets I'm, I'm generally looking for. Uh, especially in the resume as they go forward. And then I'm really looking for a high level of confidence in those individuals that come in to sit with me uh, that they are, you know, they're prepared to take on the challenge. Do you recruit against that proactive skill that we talked about? You know, the, 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 the stand up and take the risk and I'll do that job. Is that part of what you try to cover or what, you know, kind of box does that fall into? Yeah, I, I do. It's interesting. Uh, the time, by the time that an individual reaches me, they've been interviewed by the senior team. Uh, right. And I generally, last, I generally see the last two, maybe, maybe three individuals uh, that sit with me. Uh, and I always do a, this, the same exercise, uh, and it's probably not going to have any value you now if people listen to it, it's gone. But <laughs> when they listen to our podcast, but it's really helpful. And it's, it's a creative little tool that I've designed myself. But I will sit with the individual in my office, and I will literally use the, the board, the, the, the flip chart. And I, I draw a circle on the board, and I say, let's put the job that you're applying for in the middle. So keep it simple, director procurement. 
And I'll write that in the middle and I'll say, what I want is there's no right or wrong answer and it's not a trick, but help me list the competencies needed for this job. So I said, let me give you one first. So managing change. So I'll list that up and I'll say, take me through what you think. And I try to get about 10 different competencies. Now, it's interesting, a number of individuals struggle between the skill sets and an understanding of competency. So that's where I start. So imagine the arms coming out of a wheel and they've got the listed 10 and I write them all on the board. And then I take a different colored pen and I say, okay, help me number them one through 10. One being what you believe is the most important skill for the job and right through to number 10, assuming they're all important, but let's do number one. So then we'll do another round, one through 10, and then I take another colored pen and I say one more round, this time, what is your number one skill to number 10? Assuming you have skills of them all, but let's number them one more time. And what you sometimes find is what they believe is a skill for the job and the skills they actually believe is their one through five or one through 10, they, they, they actually, <laughs> there's a difference. And, and that's what I use as the discussion point. And I then drill into that on what are those skills and why do you see the difference and how can we develop you? That's the typical, I take about 30 minutes to go through that. And I do it on a flip chart. I take a picture of my phone. I roll it up and tell them to take it home. And I know that if, I, if they did it in a different environment under that less pressure, they may do it differently. But I just want to see on the wall or on the, on the flip chart the, the skills they believe are needed and the skills they believe they have. And, and I tend to go through that process. You know what I like most about that is it's really also a self-sorting attempt at determining whether or not that person is right for the job. Because through that exercise, they're really going to be able to see, wow, Maybe my skill set doesn't match up very well with this job or, wow, this is the perfect job for me because it really does align. Do you see that happening sometimes in those conversations? It's exactly what happens. And it's a very useful tool also internally because a, a number of times when a job is posted, individuals believe I've been here five years, <laughs> therefore that must be my job. And then they can quickly see that the skills needed, they don't actually qualify. So it's, a, it's just a useful little tool that I use often. Dale, it's terrific. Well, listen, we are just out of time. I want to thank you for, uh, you know, the generosity you've had with us. But we do have one last question. We ask this of all our CEOs. What career and life advice would you give to someone who's got their eyes on the corner office or, you know, maybe he wants to be an entrepreneur at some point in their, their career, making that, you know, transition from the large corporate as you did to the middle market? And we're talking to people that are, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, before we started the podcast, you know, people that are in middle management, but they're, you know, at the top of their game, they see themselves as an A player. Perhaps they're also are already in the C-suite and, you know, want to make their way to the corner office. What, what kind of, uh, you know, direction would you say is important for them at that stage in their careers? Sure. That's, that's a great question. Uh, so I would say, I would probably say there's a number of steps. So number one for me would be, Take on multiple challenges, and I mean large challenges. If you feel a little scared or nervous that this is out your wheelhouse, you've picked the right challenge. Take it on. That's number one. <laughs> right. number- Outside of the comfort zone. Yeah, absolutely. Number one. Number two would be literally remember we don't make profits at headquarters. We make profits in the manufacturing or in your business. Spend at least 60% of your time in the business, driving the business from the bottom up, spending time with your people and get to know them. The third one for me is never get so high up the ladder that you forget the guys that actually make you successful. Make sure you spend as much time. I get as upset with my employees in the kitchen, the managers, if there's no fresh flowers in the cafeteria, as I do if they have a miss in their P&L. And I truly believe that. They would tell you if you called them, fresh flowers, take care of the people. It's very important. Four would be continue to learn. Read. Go back to do some classes. Don't believe that you've because you're graduated, you're there. Continue to learn. And then I think number five would always be do everything in your power to make the place that you work a fun place to work. Be part of the team. Create a team culture. And then when these jobs open up in the corner office, people actually believe you're ready. Uh, and you'll find that companies can pick you quite easily if you tend to follow those four or five rules that I've said then I think when you get that role, people are automatically going to follow you. And I think it's, uh, it's the best job I've ever had. I love it. I enjoy it every day. Uh, and being part of a, 
a great team and I, I'm proud to be part of the team. It's it's just been, you know, it's been a rewarding journey and I and I enjoy every day that I get a chance to do it. Dale Ellison, thank you once again for sharing your journey into the corner office. It's been my pleasure. Brant, take care and I'll speak to you soon. Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.goforroi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode.